we're entering into Thanksgiving, the season of thanks, the season of, of Christmas, you know, where we celebrate the birth of Christ. Man, the new year is going to be upon us, but it's, it's, we're transitioning into a whole new season, and we're beginning a new series today that we're calling God's Way Works. Now, I believe that many of you today would agree with that statement. You'd say, yeah, I believe that. I believe God's Way Works. Works. There's some of you probably in here today that maybe don't believe that fully, and that's cool. Like you're still kind of figuring this stuff out. You know what is what is really God? What's not God? What is religion? What is man? What is what is this all about? And I'm so glad that you are here on that journey, really with all of us trying to figure trying to figure this out. But um, God's ways, we believe God's ways work. But would you agree with me that it's that even though we believe that, we don't always. Um, uh, do his way and, uh, and like do it his way and what his word says in every area of our life. It's almost like contradictory, right? Like we say, yeah, I believe it. I believe God's way. It works. And, and then, but just not in this area of my life, God, I don't want you to, I don't want your ways in this, in this area. So, so in the areas of, of our sexuality, maybe where we say, hey, you know, I believe God's ways works, but not here, God. I don't want you in, my, in this area. Or it's in the area of maybe our, our resources. Like, you know what, God, I, I believe your way works, but this area of my life, I just don't really want your way. So, so what happens is, like, really, you're not serving. When that happens, when there's a contradictory of that, you're not truly serving the God who created sex. You're serving the God of sex. You're, so, so you're not really you know, serving the God who creates resources for your enjoyment and for your pleasure. Like God created pleasure. He wanted you to enjoy life and have pleasure. So you're not creating the God who created the resources and pleasure. You're serving the God of pleasure. All right? And so, so this area of God's way works. This entire series is in this area that we like to very often compartmentalize our faith and our life with God and say, look, I believe your way works, but I just haven't invited you in this area of my life yet. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about finances and, and th- this area that kind of is, is, is uh, even just talking about it in church. Some of you have a bad religious experience or church experience where, where the, even like, uh, like you're already on, on edge to talk of, uh, about this. And, and the reason why maybe that some of us don't do it God's way is maybe when you get to the heart of it, we don't want God's way in this area of our life. I just don't want it. I'd rather, I'd rather be in the control of my own, you know, finances. So I just, I just, I don't want it. Some, for some others of us, we just haven't put the thought into it at all. It's just ignorance. It's like, I don't have a worldly budget. How am I going to know what God says about it? I don't, I don't work any type of program at all. I'm just like, I just live in month to month. And that's just, and some of us are kind of, that's why God's ways aren't working for us in the area of our finances. Maybe for others of us, um, his ways are, it's, we think that if I did it God's way, he, he just wants it all. He's going to take all my money, you know, and that's kind of like a fear that some people have. Like, if I did it his way, I'll have less, which you're going to find out in this message today and in this series, you guys, that God does not want anything from you. He does not need your money. On the contrary, if you just allow God into this area of your life, you'd find out that not only does it work, but it provides blessing and benefit into your life. Like God does not want anything from you. He actually is just wanting to give you more. That's, 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 so what would it look like? The big question of the series, what would it look like if we actually invited God to that table, to the, invited God to the decision making process of our finances. I'm telling you, we would find out that God's ways works. It works. And the Bible has a lot to say about finances. And Jesus talked about finances more than heaven and hell combined. And the reason is because we're not worried about heaven or hell when we talk about how much we worry and how much time we spend thinking about it. We're not worried as much about heaven or hell. We're worried more about money. That's what, that's what is consuming our mind and our stress and our worry. So Jesus had a lot to say over half the parables that Jesus, um, you know, the stories Jesus told were about your possessions or your money. So what we're going to do today is talk about uh, a principle, a foundational principle of of financial health, financial success, and and it's called stewardship. Stewardship. Some of you have heard that, you know, terminology before. It's like a biblical terminology. A lot of you are more familiar with it now because of Lord of the Rings and 
stuff like that. Or, or Game of Thrones, you know what I mean? Some of you know Steward of the North or whatever, they, you know, something like that. So you guys are understand the concept of stewardship. It, it, steward just means you're a manager. So one of the parables that Jesus told was called the parable of the talents. You remember the parable of the talents? We're just going to do a Bible study today. That's what we're going to do. We're going to dig into this story that Jesus told, the parable of the talents. And even that word talent might throw some of you off and tell you what that really means. But it is a story of uh, Jesus is teaching seven stewardship principles. These, these, are, these are principles that are for you. You operate by these stewardship principles, and it brings benefit, it brings blessings into your life. That's what we're going to study. I want to give you seven principles that Jesus shows us from the parable of the talents. Let's start off right there, Matthew 25, verse 14, where Jesus says this, that the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey. Now, this is the master, okay? This is the owner. In, in this parable, it's the person you're going to see. This is prophetic, you guys. The, the, the master who is going on a journey is Jesus, who, who, who ascended to the right hand of the Father and who is sitting there right now at the right hand. This is a prophetic parable. The, the master who went on the journey is actually Jesus who, who ascended into heaven. It says, he called his three servants together and he entrusted whose property? His property to them, okay? It's important you recognize this uh, within the context of the story that this is a prophetic parable, that Jesus, the master, the businessman in this parable, has left for a while and has entrusted into his servants, into us, property, resources, gifts, things, talents. It's important we recognize that it's his Stuff, though, that's what it means to be a steward. A steward is a, a manager. The English terminology for that is just a manager. That you really, you're the, and the Bible says you're not just supposed to manage or steward your finances. You're to steward your time. You're to be a steward of your um, resources. You're to be a steward of your, your uh, abilities and your talents and your relationships. And you're to be a steward or a manager of the opportunities God is giving you. So this is this is a principle that goes, the, the principle of stewardship goes beyond just finances. It is, it is it, these principles apply to every area of your life. And, I could, and if I could just say to you, to anyone who's are young in this room, junior high, high school, young adult, you don't think you have enough and you can check out, like you're not making enough money or any money, you can check out. Can I just challenge you to pay attention and take good notes? Because if you can learn the principles that I'm sharing right now from the word of God, and you can start off, you, 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 you won't make all the mistakes your mom and dad had, had to make, okay, or I had to make. You write it down right now, and you start living God's way. Invite his way into your life right now. I'm telling you, it works. Let me give them to you. This, he says he entrusted his property to his servants. That's the first principle. It's called the law of possession, which says everything I have belongs to God. That We need to just address this right up front. Just settle it. It's not my money. It all belongs to God. You say, but wait a minute. I bought this. I did this. I did this with my own hands or with my own, with my own, I, I worked for this. Oh, really? Where did you get the mind to work for? Where did you get the hands that were able to do the craft that you do? Where, where did you get the intellect? Where did you get the creativity? Where did you get the very breath in your lungs that you are breathing? It all belongs to God. That's the first principle of stewardship. It's the law of possession. Everything belongs to him. Nothing is ours. Nothing is truly yours in the kingdom of heaven. God has just given it to you for a season. You did not bring anything into this world. I've been there when, they, when, when you guys come into the world. I'm there a lot oftentimes, and, and, and naked you came in, okay? You, and, then, and by the way, I'm there at the other end as well at funerals. And I'm telling you, you can't take anything with you. I've been there, all right? You cannot take anything with you. There is no hearse that's driving a U-Haul. You ever see that? No, no, no. You know why? Because you don't take it with you. It's, it was yours for a little bit. It goes to somebody else for another season. It's not ours. We tend to think that it's ours because God has loaned it to us for a season. For instance, if, if, if someone were to have like this beach house that they were living in, but they were traveling to Spain and they said, hey, I need you to watch my house. I'd love for you to, and it'd be a blessing for you and your family. Why don't you guys just go to the beach house? Have at it. We're going to be there for a year. We're going to be there. 
Oh, oh, beach house, here I come, right? So you guys go up in the beach house. Man, you live enough for a year. A year later, the owner of the, the beach house calls you up and says, you know what? We're loving Spain so much. We're going to stay another year. Just, uh, just stay. Can you stay in the beach house? Absolutely, I can stay. Good, honey, we get to stay here another year. Two, another year goes by. The, the owner calls again and says, you know what? There's still more we got to do in Spain. It's growing on us. Stay. Enjoy the beach house hallelujah, we're going to stay another year. Okay, three total years go by, and then three years, after three years, you get a knock on the door. And it's the owner with his suitcases and with his family. He says, hey, Spain was great. We're ready to move back into our house. And you go, this ain't your house. <laughs> no, nah, possession is nine-tenths of the law. This is my house now, okay? You have to evict me out of here. Uh, we tend to think because God has loaned it to us, for a long period of time that it's yours. It ain't yours. Listen, the beach house ain't yours. Nothing is yours. It's all his. Everything belongs to God. Matthew 25, 15, he says this. To one servant, he gave five talents. To another, he gave two talents. And to another, he gave one talent, each according to his ability. Then he left. Again, this is Jesus now. Then he ascended. Now he just, he's left us with his stuff. With his gifts. The gifts he's given, the talent, the abilities, and all the personalities, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it applies there, but really what he's talking about is a Roman talent. This is a measure of money that he's talking about. And uh, a Roman talent is 71 pounds of gold. So this week, I looked it up. Gold was approximately $1,300 an ounce. That means if you got one talent of gold, you got $1.25 million. This was no small investment that the master has made to his servants. If you got two talents, like he gave to that one guy, Jesus gave $2.5 million to him to take care of. To the five talents, $6.25 million. Look, this is no small amount. The master is trusting, and God has given, he's made an enormous investment into your lives. It's no small thing, and we'll get into that in just a moment, but the first law is the law of possession. Everything, everything belongs to him. You want to be a good steward? Operate by the, the, the principles of stewardship, uh, biblical principles? Then that's the first one. Everything belongs to him. Here's the second law, because um, it says that he gave five talents to one, two to another, one to another, each according to their ability, and then he left his journey. The second law is the law of allocation. And that says that God has loaned me money. God has loaned me money. You notice that in the story, Jesus tells everybody gets a different amount. Not everyone is equally wealthy. Not everyone is equally in the same economic status. Each, you know, it says one guy got one, another guy gets two, some guy gets five. Um, the point is here that everybody gets something. There are no, no talent people in the world. Everybody, even the breath that you have, is a blessing from God. There's no, no talent people. Everybody gets something. And then once we get something, the servants of God get something, then we go out and we begin to use it. Look what it says now. Pick it up in verse 16. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work. Underline that or circle that. That's important. He put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents. He doubled his money. Man, he made one point, he made millions, this, these guys. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and just hid his master's money. There's a couple things I want to point out here. And the first is this, that money is a tool to be used. It's important for you to understand that money is a tool to be used. A lot of times, because we're chasing after it so hard, Money becomes the thing that we obsess over, not the tool to be used. If you ever get it switched where you start obsessing over money, because you're supposed to use money and love people. That's what you're supposed to do. Use money, love people. But when you obsess over it so much, you start loving money and using and abusing people. That's what happens in our life. You, and money is a good tool. Money is actually a good tool. It can be put to good use. Uh, and, and where some people say, well, wait a second, I thought money was the root of all evil, the Bible says. No, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is neutral. Money is not good 
or bad. It just, it just is. And the Bible says that you've got to learn how to put your money to work instead of working for your money all the time. There's a difference. If you're constantly working for money, you will be going from paycheck to paycheck, constantly needing more money if you're always working for money. You need to learn how to make money work for you. You see, when that happens, when you make your money work for you, money becomes your servant, not the other way around. Okay? See, in our culture, we've got this society right now that the way that we are living, constantly under pressure, constantly in stress, constantly in debt, we are actually servants of money, and it is never supposed to be that way. The money was supposed to be our servant. Listen, money makes a great servant. It makes a terrible master. And so many people are living mastered by their, by their money. You've got to learn how to put it to work for you. It says he gives the money out to these three servants, and, and one goes out and invests it, puts it to work. Another one does the same thing, but one goes and hides it in the ground. Here's the point, you guys, that you get to choose what you do with what God gives you. You get to choose what you do with the resources, the time, all the abilities, with the resource, with the money. You, get, you don't get to choose what he gives you. You don't get to choose that, but you get to choose how you use it. And please listen, God is watching that. God is watching how we use that money and our resources. Look what it says in Matthew 25, 19. After a long time, the master of the three servants returned to settle his accounts. One day, okay, what is, okay this is prophetic. So one day he's going to return. This is, this is talking about the second return, the coming of Christ. And at that time, He's going to settle the accounts. We're going to get to heaven one day, and God is going to say to each and every one of us, what did you do with the stuff I gave you? Okay, he's not going to, he's not going to say, how come you weren't more like your dad? How come you weren't like your brother? How come you weren't like, weren't like, he's not going to say that. And, 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 and in turn, we can't say, well, God, you didn't give me the five cents. You gave everyone else, you know, you only gave me a million dollars, God. Everyone else got more, more than me. And God's going to go, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you. What did you do with what I gave you? Because I gave you opportunities. I gave you freedoms. I gave you creativity. I gave you energy. I gave you resources. What did you do with what I gave you? I made a big investment into you. Man, I entrusted you with something. I went on my journey, but now it's time. I've come back and I said, I, I told you I was coming back. What'd you do with what I gave you? This is the third law, the law of accountability. And that says that one day, God will audit me. <laughs> we don't like that word too much because we like, we like the IRS. This isn't the IRS. This is G-O-D, okay? The God, the God audit is not a money audit. It's a life audit. God wants to, he's going to bring into account everything. Like, like in, in not like the IRS. In the IRS, you got you to find all your paperwork and do all the root digging for it. Don't worry, in this audit, God's got all the paperwork already, okay? He's, you don't need to bring anything. It's already, it's already there. He's, he's going to have it. It's just going to be brought into account. Everything will be brought into account. There's going to come a day where he says, what did you do? I made some investments into your life. W what was the return? Look at Romans 14, 12. It says, so then, each of us will give an account of ourselves. Not of our neighbor, not of anyone else. We'll give an account of ourselves to God. If you want to be a good steward, you have to understand this principle that I'm not out here on an island, not living accountable, not li No, no, no. I will be brought into account one day. I will be made accountable. This is the law of accountability. One day, God's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? And we've got three different stories, three different guys. One, the first guy has a good ROI, right? A good, a good return on investment, that, that terminology, a good return on investment. Look at this guy. Matthew 25, 20. The man who had received five talents brought the, brought the other five he made. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful stir. You made me $13 million. Man, I guess so. Good job, dude. This guy got in on Google early or Netflix or something like that. This guy, this guy doubled his 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 investment, okay? And then the second guy, same, same thing for the second guy. The second guy had a good return. Then the servant with two talents of money also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. Now see, I've gained two more. The master replied, well done, 
good and faithful servant, 100% return on the master's investment. But the third guy didn't have a good story to tell, okay? Because he did not use what God gave him wisely. And I feel sorry for this guy. I really do. Because I do, because I was this guy at one point. I don't know if you, have you ever, have you ever tried to like do the minimum you needed to do at some job or work or assignment, thinking like, I'll just get by, it's okay, only to find out when, when to bring your minimum work that everyone else that was involved brought their A game? And you're like, ah, oh, shoot, man, I'm, I found out. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. That, that, like when I was in, in grade school and we do the, you know, the science projects you got to do, you got to build the mission. I was a terrible student, you guys. And I'm, don't, don't, don't follow me on this area, kids. You, you need to do better than your pastor did here. But I waited till the last day. Like that was me, procrastinator. The last day to do my science experiment or whatever would build the mission. I'm cutting cardboards and gluing them together. It's all falling apart. I put macaroni on top. It's not even covering the, the top. And I'm all, I drew, I drew trees and animals on the cardboard. I didn't even put stuff on there. I'm just like, I just draw it. It's all good, you know, and it's going to be okay, you know. And, and I bring it in there and I look, and I'm like, oh my God, these guys, you, you had your dad do that for you. Liar, liar. You did not do that. Your dad's an architect, okay? <laughs> That's going to happen here. And I just, I feel bad for this guy because he's like sitting back and he's going, ah, oh, dang, this, this guy just doubled. He doubled too. Oh man. And this is, so this is the story. Yeah. The man who had received one talent said this. He said, master, he said, I knew you were a hard man. Notice he's turning the tables. He's trying to blame the boss now. Okay. Master, I knew that you were a hard man investing or harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I was afraid. I'd lose your money. He went out, so I went out and hid your talent in the ground. I buried it. See, here's what belongs to you. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. What, what was the master's reply to the servant? You wicked and lazy servant, he said. I want to study this real quick. This is in the Bible for a reason. This guy buries what God gives him. He does nothing with it. He doesn't use his talent. And then he blames the master for his own mismanagement and failures. Does that sound familiar, you guys? We live in a culture, in a society today that where they mess up, people mess up their lives, they don't know what to do, so they blame the government. Or they blame their parents. Or they blame even God. They just blame everybody. Look, God did not cause you to make those expenses on your credit card. God did not cause you to buy that car you know you can't afford. God did not cause you to buy that house you know you could not afford. God is, did not cause you. The Bible says this in Proverbs 19 and 3. Not in your notes, up here on the screen. People ruin themselves by their own stupid decisions and then blame the Lord. Can I get an amen? That's, that's what's going on. That leads us to the fourth principle of stewardship. Here it is. It's the law of utilization that says this. I must wisely use God's money. The law of utilization. I must wisely use God's money. Notice what the master's response here to this guy who's whining. He says in verse 27, you should have at least put my money into a bank account so that it would make some interest. Like you buried it, dude. Like you could have just even, a savings account would have gave you something. Put it into something. Put it, put it into something so that I would just at least get an, an interest. And this guy just digs a hole buries it into the, into the ground, and, and, and hoards it. And that's what some people do. They try to hoard it. They try to hide it. They try to sit on top of it. They don't do nothing to it. Just don't do nothing to it. Can I tell you something? Money is like manure. Manure is really good if you spread it around, okay? But you start piling it up, it starts stinking, all right? You start piling up your money, it just still starts stinking up your life. Here's this third guy. He takes what he, his master has given him, and he doesn't do anything with it. And is the master upset? absolutely he's upset are you kidding me he says you wicked and lazy servant is does that seem like a little bit harsh for what we're talking about i mean we're talking about money mismanagement you, i mean god is here calling this guy wicked and because when i think of wickedness i think of like rape and murder i mean wicked so i'm i'm thinking like child abuse i'm thinking like sex trafficking bondage and forced slavery i think of those things when i think of witness wickedness but this is what God is saying in this parable. He's saying, Jason, it is wicked anytime you misuse or abuse the resources I gave you. 
If you don't use them wisely, that's wicked. This is a test. How we use it is a test. God says, I put you on earth to see if I can trust you with earthly riches, because I got true riches later. I just, I need to see, I want to be able to bless you more. I want to see if I can trust you with more, with, if you can manage, if you can be a good steward. And doing nothing is inexcusable. And this is true with everything in life. Doing nothing with your talent, just sitting on it, and not, doing, not using your talent, doing nothing with your money and just sitting on it, you don't use it. Doing nothing with your time, you just sit on it instead of using it. You don't invest it into eternal things. Um, what do you do with it? What did he do with it? It says, I, it says he buried it. That's what it says. He, what do you, what, when you bury something in your life, when you actually bury something, what does that mean when you do that? It means you want to just forget about it, huh? Just bury that. We just, I just want to act like it's not there. It's buried. It's in the past. I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist. I'm going to deny it. I mean, and this is, look, money is, is Jesus taught here that money management is spiritual management. You cannot separate the two. You cannot compartmentalize your life. Money management is a spiritual discipline here. And you can't, money is far too important for you to just pretend that the problem isn't there. And that is why so many people will live in tremendous debt because they're just, they, they're getting credit card. And I know I'm, I know I got a lot of credit card debt, but I just, I just like to just forget about it. I'm not even going to just look at the bill. I'm not going to look at the bill. I'm not going to just, I'm just going to act like it's not there. And, and we're servants to money, and it's mastering us. Listen to me, please, when you do that, when you just bury it, and you act like it's not there, and you're not treating it like the spiritual discipline and the test that it is, God is saying, that is wicked. Hey, you, you acting like that it's not there, you acting like it doesn't exist, you being a, a, a lazy servant with what I gave you is wicked. That's what he's, that's what he's telling us. He's upping the, the, the ante on this because God did not put you on earth you guys to just do nothing he made an enormous investment into your life but he goes and buries this treasure he was given why do we do that why do we why do we bury the talents and the treasures why why do we why do we do that just bury them and don't put them to use in our life can I take can I give you like one of the biggest reasons we do that it's fear we're afraid this brings us to the next law law number five is the law of motivation it says, I must move against my fear. See, the, the, I must move against my fear. This, this servant was afraid. Uh, I must move against it, okay? Because with every talent, there is a corresponding fear to keep you from using that talent. If you have a, if you have a talent in singing, there's a fear that if, if, if I sing, no one will like it. If, if, you, if God has given you a vision for a business to start up, there's a fear that what if I fail in that? If you have a talent in any other area, there's, there's always be this what ifs in the back of your mind that keep you from stepping out and doing what God has created you to do. What keeps us from investing in our lives? What keeps us from using our talent? It's fear. Matthew 25, 25, that servant said, I was afraid and went out and hid your money in the ground. In God's word, listen, in God's word, there are principles that God guarantees. Not me, I'm not guaranteeing anything. This is God's word. He guarantees that if you do these principles, these financial principles, you will be blessed. But the problem is, it's counterculture. Like, it's going to go against what you feel like doing. It will. So then God says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make this a test. I'm testing you in this. Do you trust me or are you trusting yourself? And the reason why a lot of people never get out of debt is because they're unwilling to trust God in the steps that he tells us to do to get out of that debt. They're afraid to do what the Bible says to do, so they just go year to year, constantly living in debt, hand to mouth, barely getting by, overspending, overstressing. But God promises that if I follow his commands... And we're going to look at all, all these principles, these financial principles uh, in God's word in this series. He says, if you do these, it will, it will bring blessing and benefit into your life. But it requires faith. It requires faith. This happens in a lot of areas. People get afraid of doing what God has called them to do. People, you know, they, they're afraid. I'm afraid if I don't sleep around, I'll never get married. This is a fear. 
People, ah, I'm, afraid, I, I'm afraid I'll never get out of debt if I do what God wants me to do. And God says, those fears are going to hold you back from what I've called you to do. He says, I was afraid and I hid your money in the ground. And we're getting to the real issue here, you guys, with this fear. There are multiple kinds of fears that will hold you back from using the talents and using the investment that God put inside of you. There's multiple fears. Let me give them to you. They're not in your notes. I ran out of room. They're up here if you want to take extra notes. Here's one fear. This is a big one. Self-doubt. Self-doubt. Well, I could never do that. I mean, you've always had a dream of starting that business, but you think, I'm not qualified. Or you had a dream of serving God or making a difference or being a leader, but, oh, I'm not qualified. You doubt yourself. Here's the second fear, the fear of failure. Stop so many people from even trying, the fear of failure. How many of you, you, you had a hard time, like, raising your hand, like, when the teacher called on you? Anyone had a hard time doing that? Yeah, some of you still have a hard time. You're like, eh, eh. Yeah, it's this fear of failure. Here's a third one, self-consciousness. That's another fear. We're just self-conscious. We, what will other people think of me? The Bible says that fear of man is a trap. If, you're gonna, if you constantly are afraid of what other people think, you'll never be pleasing to God. You'll live for people instead of God. Here's the, the fourth one is self-pity. Self-pity. I mean, I failed in the past, so I'm just not going to try again, which is just so dumb. I'm telling you, just because you failed in your past, don't give up, man. That's just, everybody fails. Everyone fails, you guys. That's just, call it something else if it makes you feel better. Call it an experiment. Call it education, right? It was just education. I just got a little, I learned in that. I mean, if, fear, if failure was education, a lot of us are well-educated, you know what I mean? We have a lot of well-educated people here. Uh, you didn't, this guy didn't move against his fears. So we see this next principle. And I want to give you the scripture first in verse 28. The master says this. This guy, this guy didn't use what I gave him, the little bit that I gave him. Matthew 25, 28. He says, take away the money from this servant, the guy who had one talent, and give it to the one who has 10 talents. You got to be kidding me. Give it to the guy who already has a bunch already. Who has a guy. The guy's got $13 million. What are you talking about, God? Yeah, give it to that guy, he says. Because to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But to those who are unfaithful, even with the little they have, will be taken away. Here's the sixth principle of stewardship. It's the law of application, which says, if I don't use it, I'll lose it. That's the law of application. If I don't use it, I'll lose it. If you try to hoard it, sit on it, be selfish with it, you'll lose it. By the way, this is a law of the universe. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. If you don't use your muscle, you'll lose your muscle. Some of you guys in here today, you were like, you know, you brag about it. I was all state linebacker in high school, and now you're a tub of goo, bro. What happened? <laughs> what happened? You didn't use it, so you lose, you lose it, okay? It's, it's, it's universal. You don't lose, if you don't use your talents. Some of you are talented musically. You're talented in different, in different trades. If you don't, you will lose that talent. If you don't use your intellect, if you don't use your mind, your mind will become dull. You will lose your mind. This is a universal principle, the law of application. If you don't use it, you will lose it. It's the same principle with the talents, the resources, even the money God gave you. God says, look, I'm watching. I'm, I'm watching here how you're using this. And God is saying, can I trust you? I mean, I gave you, I gave you a little bit. I started you off with an entry-level job. You got an entry-level job, entry-level responsibilities. God is saying, I, I'm watching how you use it because I have more for you. And I'm seeing, can I trust you with the little? Because if I can trust you with the little, I can give you more. There's one more law. The law of compensation. And that says that God will re reward me for good management. I mean, you want to be a faithful steward. You want, you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. The law of compensation says God rewards me for good management. Money is the acid test of faithfulness. It is the area of our lives that God uses more than I believe anything else to test our faithfulness is this area of money why? Because it's the thing we have the hardest time with. It is. Look at the rewards God gives for wise money management in verse 21. It says, the master replied, well done, 
good and faithful servant. That's the first war reward. That's affirmation. God says, there's going to come a day, one day, when God brings into account, and this is my prayer for you, Discovery Church, as your pastor. It's my personal prayer that one day that we can stand before God individually, and God would look at us with a smile and say, well done, good job. That's my boy. That's my girl. Man, you you did good with the resources, with the time, with the opportunities, with the creativity, with the energy, with everything I gave you. Well done. Good job. That's the first reward we get, the affirmation of our Father. Look at it. It continues. There's more rewards. He says, you've been faithful with few things. Now I'll put you in charge of many things. That's a second reward, and that's promotion. First, there's affirmation, and then there's promotion. God says, man, I I was watching how you would handle earthly treasures. And because you were faithful with these earthly treasures, you thought, man, you thought 13 million was a lot of money. It ain't nothing to what I have for you. In heaven, I have true riches. There's greater responsibility. Man, because you were faithful with earthly riches, it doesn't compare with what I have next for you. Come on in. I got a promotion for you, son. There's a promotion coming for those who are wise stewards of their of their resources. And then he says, I love this. He says, come in and share in your master's happiness. That's the third reward of celebration. God says, come on in. It's time to party. I love that about God. We, we serve, a, you guys know we serve a God who likes to party, man. There's so many celebrations in scripture where they're just celebrating. There's a party and there's hosts and there's, there's, they're sacrificing the fattened calf. I mean, God is, there's going to come a day where God looks at you and he's going to bring you to account. And that's what I want to hear. That's what I want for you. That's my goal as your pastor to lead you, not just here, to make things better for you here on earth. That's not why I'm here. I hope that things get better for you. I do. I hope you're walking in favor and blessing. But my goal is to help you get there to that final destination where God can say to you, well done, good and faithful servant and enter the rewards that God has promised for you. Money's the acid test to show how much you trust God. In the next several weeks, you guys, this is, this is where we're going to go. There's, there's three more messages. And when, when we talk about money and finances in church, you might, some people think, oh, he's gonna, it's about giving. No, it ain't. It ain't. There's so many principles, I'm telling you, out of God's word, that if you just invite God's ways, I promise you they work. If you just invite him into this area of your life, you're going to find out that, man, his ways work, and it will position you for blessing and, and favor of God. Look what Jesus says here in verse uh, chapter 16 of Luke. He says, if you're untrustworthy with worldly wealth, he, it, that means if you don't manage your money on earth, if you don't manage it well, you're always in debt. You're not able to give. You're not able to be generous. You're not able to invest and give to someone in need who will trust you with the true riches of heaven. I mean, if I can't trust you with earthly money, if money on here, how am I going to trust you with the true riches, with the money of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's money, why should you be trusted with money of your own? This is Jesus talking here. He says, no one can serve two masters. You're either going to hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You see, when we block God's ways out of our life, you think, you think that, that, that God does not see that. God wants to be Lord of your entire life. His ways work across the board, I promise you. He doesn't want anything from you. He doesn't want to take anything from you. God wants to bless you as you bring every area of your life under his provision. So here's your declaration today. I want you to write it down. This to be part of your altar call, okay? This, and, and don't write this if you're, not, if you're not ready to make this declaration, all right? Because this is, this is where we're going in the next several weeks inside this series. Here's the declaration I'm challenging you to make. That I will rearrange my life to reflect the reality that God owns everything, and I am his faithful steward. God, that's my declaration, God. 
that I'm going to rearrange my life to, to, to reflect the reality that, God, you are owner of it all. I don't own anything. I am just a steward. God, it is yours, and I am your faithful steward. Come on, after you're done write, writing that down, go ahead and bow your heads right there, right where you're at. God, that's our declaration. God, forgive us for living in a way that makes us master, that makes us owner when we don't own a thing. Today, God, we're going to rearrange. We're going to reprioritize. Your ways work. Your ways are good. Your ways are a blessing in every area of our life. So, God, we're not going to live ignorant anymore. We're going to invite you into this area of our life that maybe I've stiff-armed you. Maybe I've just been ignorant. Maybe I've just buried it and pretend it doesn't exist. But this is spiritual management. So today, God, I'm inviting you in to this area of my resources, my talents, my, my money, my finances. And I declare that I'm going to rearrange it. I'm going to rearrange my entire life to reflect this reality. God, that you're owner of it all. I don't own a thing. I'm your faithful steward, God. I want to hear one day, I want to hear you say, my master, my king, my God, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Every head bow and eye close, you're here today, and maybe like that, you, you want to be able to hear those words on that day. And you just, you, maybe you've never heard this topic be taught this way, and, and, and God is tugging on your heart to just, to just come, just to give your life to Jesus today. And the, Bible, the Bible says that, that the way you do that, that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you will be saved. That's it. That's all you have to do. And, and it's an inside-out job. God, you don't, need to, you don't need to fix anything on the outside. God loves you just the way you are. And he wants to indwell you just the way you are. He will change you from the inside out.